In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst. So today we hear this gospel reading that we are all familiar with, where Christ looks at the, those on his right-hand side and places those on his right-hand side as being the sheep, and the left-hand side as being goats. And I don't think that, um, you know, looking at this gospel reading that we can look and say goats are just bad things and the sheep are good and we need to be sheep and not goats and although that is kind of the the example of what a sheep is versus a goat a sheep is obedient to the shepherd so those who have followed christ are, are considered his sheep but we look at today and we we look at the gospel reading and it tells us something very special which is the fact that when christ looks at us that he already knows what we are. And St. Theophan, the recluse, mentions very clearly, he says that we mark ourselves with who we are. So it's not even like Christ had to decide, you, know, you kind of look a cross between a sheep and a goat, or maybe you're part horse. He just says, the ones that are this are on this side, the ones who are this are on the other side. And it was very clear because we are marked with what we do. Now, St. John Chrysostom says very clearly, too, he says that it's, it's very simple to do the things that Christ asks us to do in the Gospel reading today. It's within our power. It's very simple. But the key to that is to understand what is within our power. Now, I'm going to use our chanter as a, an example. He doesn't have to move or anything. Um, but... Costa's been here since the morning. He sings for the time when everybody is blow-drying their hair at home, right? I mean, it's, it's the orthros, the chanter sings, people get ready. Um, there's some of you that are here, and that's wonderful, but for the most part, Costa sings pretty much for the whole hour. So what do we, what would be a need? Well, this, right? This little bottle of water. I had two bottles, but we lost the chanter, so I'm going to give Costa both bottles because they're really cold in my pockets. But what does it take to just go and to give water to someone? He's not going to drink it now because he knows better, but, um, but what does it take to give someone something when you see what they're, what's happening with them? So what does the gospel reading tell us today? It tells us that those things that Christ mentioned in doing to other people require very simple responses, but it requires something before the response, which is really what's missing. And what is that? What is that response that we have to do before we start doing actions? And the key to that is to be awake, to be alive, to be alert, to see what is going on around us. You know, it's, it's interesting sometimes when you're, you're looking around at something in particular, you have your eye focused on something, you can miss complete other things that are around you. And um, I had mentioned uh, just recently about that focus when I had gone to, seen, uh, gone to see uh, the, the church at St. John Maximovich my first time there. I was by myself. This was um, about a year and a half ago or so. And uh, I stayed in one part of San Francisco that was the cheapest hotel, right? And, you know, I figured in San Francisco, it's expensive to stay. I'll stay in the cheapest hotel. Well, this cheapest hotel was not in the greatest of neighborhoods. And being that it was nice and I was enjoying the weather because the weather here was unsavory to say the least, um, I walked on the way back from St. John. And as I walked, I walked down one particular street that I would not recommend anybody walk down that street. But what happened was I was walking down and I noticed that there was all these people and some of them were doing terrible things on the street and dealing certain things and, and uh, uh, certain individuals who had a, a profession that is uh, very un-Christian uh, as far as the direction, if you want to let your mind go there. Um, and I remember walking and going, I just, I just came back from St. John and I'm going to go back to my hotel and I'm going to walk right through the midst of all these things, and I walked right through the midst of it, and I just was uh, so focused on, on, on seeing St. John and, and meeting the clergy there that it, I walked through the midst of this, and you know, by God's grace and with St. John's protection, uh, I was okay. But I always recommend when people go visit St. John, take a cab 
um, no matter where you're staying or the uh, bus. But what was that? It's the focus of taking your mind off of what's around you in the negative. But the same thing happens with the focus on the things that are happening negatively to others. Is someone around you down? Is someone around you thirsty? Are they hungry? Are they needy? Are they, do they need clothing? And many times we think too that, oh, there's the Red Cross that'll take care of that or the Salvation Army or all these other things that will um, take care of the needs of people. But we're called by Christ to see the needs of others and to respond to the needs of others in a very simple way. How hard was it for me to give Costa a, a bottle of water? And how hard would it be for each of you to bring a can of food to the church? Or how hard would it be for you to look at, at your family members or friends or neighbors or, or even rewinding even more than that to your spouses or your children and to really see what the needs are, to really see where they're hurting? And it might not just be the things where we say, what are the basic necessities of life, right? Food, shelter, you know, those types of things. But beyond that, what are the needs of the heart? What are the needs of the spiritual thirsting that people have? And especially when it starts in the core of our own families. As you look at this Lenten journey that's coming up, we're reminded of this day today, this last judgment Sunday. That's what this Sunday is called. But it's called the Last Judgment. Now, St. Augustine of Hippo says that it's called the Last Judgment because we've already been judged, partially. And that will be the final judgment. So what's the partial judgments that we have already? Well, we were all born expelled from the, the paradise, expelled from the Garden of Eden with that original sin. And what are the results of that sin? Well, we've been, we, we all die, we all get sick, we all have maladies that, that come. We, we have all these things that will get to us sooner or later. But the last judgment is the final and the last moment of when we come before God and we are there and we, he says, you're here, you're here. I mean, it's very simple. I mean, if you think about it with your lives, if you really think and say, what am I? Am I good or am I bad or do I not know? And the whole point of what the fathers of the church say too is when we die, we will have, if, if I mean, just take a moment and think if, if you die and Christ says to you, you cannot come in. You're, you're, you can't be by me. You just didn't do anything. You didn't make the simple efforts. You didn't try. And he says, you can't come in. What's going to happen? You're going to start crying, right? Everybody would you'd start wailing. And the fathers of the church remind us over and over that the way to stop wailing in the kingdom of heaven is to start wailing here. The only way we can cleanse ourselves of our sins is not after our death and crying about all the things that we did wrong, but to cry about them here. And uh, the fathers of the church remind us too, if you can't weep here, then just shed a tear. If you can't shed a tear, shed remorse. If you can't have remorse, try and evaluate your life and come to the point of repentance. But start from now and don't wait until the very end. And I think too with the understanding of the last judgment, we really don't perceive the length of eternity. I know that some of you um, sometimes in church will say, well, that service took forever. Or Father Peter took too long to, to make the announcements or to preach or whatever. But if you think that's long, think about eternity. And if you think about eternity, think about if you're not in the grace of God for eternity. I mean, just think about it here. If you were to come to church for an hour and 15 minutes or whatever it is on a Sunday, and you're in church, and the temperature is so hot in here that you're burning, your skin is burning. I mean, I know when it's cold in here that people say, oh, Father, it's so cold in church, and it's freezing, and can you do something about the temperature? But just imagine an eternity of that deprivation of God's presence. That is what the fathers of the church call hell, is existing and not being in the presence of God. Because our soul will go on, our bodies will not, 
but our soul will go back to the place from where it received its being, as the funeral service says. So as you look forward to Lent, what are we called to do? What, what's the point of this gospel reading today? Well, the point is, just make a simple effort. Make the simple effort to be awake, to be alert of what's happening around you, to move forward in your, your alertness, to say, okay, this, this is the things that they need around me, the people that I love and that I care for, and these are also the things that I need, too. And when I say I, when we refer to our needs, and I say I need, what do we really need? And we have to, again, readjust that lens and say, do I really need um, these extravagant things or these side things, or what do I really need for my salvation? And as you go in your Lenten journey to make the small efforts, as St. John Chrysostom says, it's within our power to do these things. They're very simple things to do. How hard is it to give away a coat? How hard is it to give somebody water? How hard is it to say a kind word to someone? And we might say, well, I'm not going to say a kind word to someone or I'm not going to, um, I don't have inner peace because this person insults me and they say bad things about me. And, <coughs> excuse me, and St. Seraphim of Seraph speaks very clearly when he says, you have to hold on to your peace. You have to grab on and hold on to that inner peace, even in the midst of insults. And Elder Thaddeus, who we have his book in the bookstore, um, who is a, a contemporary elder of the church and also will be a saint one day. You can write that in your calendars too. Um, he also says, don't give up your inner peace for anything. But what really brings us inner peace is the key. And the only way you can find out what inner peace is, and the only way that you can really move forward in your, in your path to God, is to be awake and alert. And many times we say, oh, that person, they're just dead. They're just, they're, they're so lost and they're gone. Well, they might be lost. They might be distracted, taken away. But they're not dead. No one is dead until we're dead. And as, um, as one of my professors said, no one's a martyr unless they're martyred. And no one is dead unless they're dead. So what are we in a slumber? And it's our, our calling for ourselves and for those around us to snap out of that slumber and to do just simple things and just try. Because if God's to come back to us and say, were you trying? All you have to do is say yes. He doesn't expect perfection because he knows who we are. He doesn't expect perfection at all because he is very familiar with the history of the world. He's very familiar with Adam and Eve and all the, the uh, people who have supported him and followed him and the ones who have betrayed him. So he knows we're not perfect. He doesn't expect perfection. So in your path in the Lenten journey, don't expect perfection. Just expect change for the better. Just expect some growth in the right direction. Because no one is perfect. Only God is perfect. But the only way we can start to grow in that perfection of God and to have his grace come upon us is to do these simple little things and piling them all together. And if you think about the, the kids, uh, most of you have kids here or have, um, if you don't, you've, had some experience with Legos or Lincoln Logs or building blocks or Duplos or whatever. How does a big structure start? You know, I was, uh, my, my sons, you know, it's like we're, like we're a Lego factory at, at our house. I'm sure you guys have that too, where you just have Legos everywhere and different things. And then you get a package from someone from, from Christmas and you shake it and you hear, it sounds like just a, a shattered uh, atrium in a small box, right? And it's just, these pieces jangling in there and you shake it and you're like, oh, this is going to take hours to do, right? And it's 1,100 pieces and they're all tiny pieces and, and, you know, you start pulling it back like this. Is this blue or is this gray? Where does this go? And then page after, and then now what they have is so nice. They have a second book because it's too much to put in one book, right? And you put one page together and you put this piece and you put this together and then pretty soon, all of a sudden now you have a, 
a Star Wars destroyer ship or whatever that's like 8,000 pieces and you're afraid to move it because you know when you move it, you're going to break it and you're going to have to start over. And you build this giant Lego set from little tiny little pieces. And hours later, you have something that resembles whatever that was supposed to be. It's the same thing with our spiritual lives. We start out with little tiny little pieces, little bottle of water here, kind word here, extra prayer here, uh, an extra donation to this or that or whatever, and, and to offer ourselves an extra time in church. Doing those little things are putting all those blocks to our spiritual life together so that when we come together and we look at something extraordinary like the icon of Christ in the dome, that all started from one little paintbrush stroke at a time. And then what has it turned into? All these icons. The entire church was built one brick at a time. Your spiritual life is one small, doable gesture at a time that will lead to something that will lift us up. Amen.